as our app for newcomers to Canada and British Columbia specifically. We're really excited about that. Thank you. <laughs> and in Jordan, we amplify Voices for Peace with a social cohesion um, program where we foster artists and youth to increase community resilience um, and combat violent extremism in online spaces. Should I say anything more? Okay. Um, and Peace Talks are a space that we created um, many years ago when Peace Geeks first started because tech and social issues can feel complex and scary and we wanted to create a space to spark critical and engaging discussion amongst the public in an open and accessible format about peace and tech issues that we're confronting in the contemporary world. Today is our 41st of the series um, and some previous topics include talking about racism in Canada, reconciliation in the knowledge economy, and last year we had the honor of hearing from three members of Syria's White Helmets, who were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize two years in a row. Um, just a reminder about donations, we keep Peace Talks free because we want to make these issues accessible to everyone, but your donations do help ensure that these and our other projects continue running. So thank you so much for supporting us. If you would like to make a donation this evening, there is a donation jar at the table by the door. And I'll just finish up with a couple other housekeeping items. As Nori mentioned, bathrooms are just through the glass door to the left. You just grab a key from the wooden fob um, on the hook next to the door. And there's also a bathroom down the hallway um, to the right if the other ones, um, if all the keys are gone. If you are tweeting or Instagramming or Facebooking or other social platforms that I don't know about um, posting tonight, please use our hashtags, hashtag peace talk and hashtag disinfo talk or tag us at peace geeks. Those pieces of paper are located around the event space this evening in case um, I rambled too quickly and you didn't pick up. So yeah, but hashtag peace talks at Peace Geeks. Um, and the Wi-Fi password is located on the wall um, by the blue illuminated art piece over here. If you would like to utilize the, the Wi-Fi, the password and the network name are there on the little um, orange honeycomb. The event, as you can tell, is being photographed and video recorded this evening. Please let a staff member or photographer know if you don't want to be included. And if you need to identify any Peace Geek staff members, we are all wearing these blue glasses on our person in some way, shape, or form. Rasmus, I see that you are not wearing the blue glasses. <laughs> but Rasmus is also a Peace Geek staff. <laughs> and um, where Abdi is standing in the green shirt at the back, um, there's a curved yellow wall, and we have a couple post-its um, already attached to the wall. If you have a question or a topic of discussion related to tonight's theme that you would like us to talk about when we open um, the panel up to the audience and moderated questions, please write the question down over there. Um, and Abdi can come around and collect if you are already seated or you can just feel free to go up at any time and stick your question on the wall. And if you haven't had food already, we have plenty of food available. We like everybody to be well fed, so please help yourself. And last but not least, I would like to thank the partners of tonight's event. This Peace Talk has been supported by the Digital Rights Community Grant Program, a partnership between the Digital Justice Lab, Tech Reset Canada, and the Center for Digital Rights. And we wanna say a special thank you to community partners who helped us to share the event, um, including Data Science for Social Good, Amnesty International, um, Simon Fraser University International, and Simon Fraser University Public Square. So if I seem very um, out of my element, it's because I am. Cherry is my wonderful colleague. She's the design lead here at Peace Geeks, and she was going to MC the event. We had Nadia Stewart scheduled to come and moderate the event, but unfortunately Nadia had to go cover a wildfire on Pender Island this afternoon. So Cherry stepped into Nadia's um, seat, and I stepped up to Cherry's standing position, and here we are. So without further ado, Cherry's going to take the evening away. Um, we look forward to an evening of really fruitful um, conversation, and she will introduce all the speakers to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for the intro, and thank you all of you for being here. Um, we send our best wishes to Nadia over on Pender Island on the Sunshine Coast as families are being evacuated from there, I think. Um, 
So thank you, everyone, for joining me um, for my first time as a moderator and for bearing with me on this roller coaster ride of an evening. Um, it's truly an honor. I've been really excited to organize this talk and um, excited to be surrounded by these intelligent and bright individuals who will be speaking for us today, um, especially with um, this timely topic. Um, this morning, I just saw the announcement that Twitter will be banning political ads from June 30th until the election campaign for Canada's elections. Um, so certainly digital influence around elections are top of mind today and I'm really thrilled to be able to talk about it with all of you. So it's without further ado that I introduce you to all of our speakers today. Um, on our very left is John Gray. He is a Miss InfoSec analyst who through his roles with the Credibility Coalition and his company, Mention Map Analytics, researches suspect behaviors and persistent threats operating throughout the information landscape. He thinks that the bad guys are winning because they have a playbook and toss aside the rule book, while the good guys read the rule book but have no playbook. John's researched and written multiple case studies about synthetic online behaviors and disinformation. He's co-authored the paper, Hashtag Kremlin, using hashtags to analyze Russian disinformation and audience engagement to be presented at the 2019 American Political Science Association Conference, and has collaborated with journalists and publications including Reuters, 2019 Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting, Myanmar Burning, and Wired. John has a Bachelor of Applied Science in Communications and a Bachelor of Arts in English, both from Simon Fraser University. Um, to second from the left is Lindsay Sample. She is the managing editor at The Dis Discourse, um, an award-winning digital news media company that provides in-depth journalism in local communities. Lindsay has shaped the Discourse's editorial process, executed large partnerships, published research on the state of the industry, and is working to build a new model for community-engaged journalism in Canada. Previously, Lindsay was an investigative journalist for CBC Marketplace for three years. She's also completed stints at CBC Radio's As It Happens, um, produced a radio documentary for The Current, and produced videos for The New York Times. And finally, to my left is Chris Tenno. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. Um, Chris is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia. He teaches and conducts research on the use of digital technologies in politics focusing on issues of democratic integrity, international relations, political theory, and public policy. In November 2018, the Public Policy Forum published a report he co-authored with Heidi Torek and Fenwick McKelvey called Poisoning Democracy, How Canada Can Address Harmful Speech Online. Dr. Tenev previously worked as a journalist. His features have appeared in Maclean's, The Walrus, Ca Canadian Geographic, Adbusters, Vancouver, Reader's Digest, Canada, The Globe and Mail, The Taiyi, The National Post. Um, and as a broadcaster, his documentaries have appeared on CBC Ideas, The Radio Netherlands World Service, and This American Life. So we've got some really <laughs> esteemed guests with very long bios with us today. Um, and please join me in giving these folks a round of applause for being here. Thank you, everyone. So here's what we can expect for tonight. I have the pleasure of facilitating a conversation with these folks, and we're going to keep it a pretty open um, conversation where we're all supporting each other, because as you know, I have fallen into this position as moderator. Um, but also, you have the opportunity of asking us questions. As Lauren mentioned, um, we have the post-it wall at the back, so we encourage you, um, there should be post-its in the aisle or on the chairs as well as you think of them to write them down and we'll have volunteers come by and collect them. Um, we also believe um, at Peace Talks that it's really important, especially at events like these where the topic can be very um, oriented around big tech and policy and regulation, things that really seem kind of out of touch for all of us, um, that you still leave feeling like you can take action and that there are next steps that you can take in your personal lives. So tonight we're having a bit of a breakout um, session or discussion amongst all of you um, uh, around how you encounter harmful speech and misinformation within your personal lives and talk a little bit about what you can do um, in your private lives. And that's something I'm really looking forward to is 
um, learning from, from these folks and from all of you on your personal experiences today. Um, does that sound good for everyone? Great. Okay, so Chris, um, can you start us off with a bit of a lay of the land for folks who are pretty brand new to the topic um, and tell us a little bit about, you know, what does misinformation actually look like in Canada? Um, what do we know from elections elsewhere? And, you know, kind of the big question is, are we immune from misinformation? Great. Um, well, thank you, Jerry. And uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this event. I'm a tremendous fan of PeaceGates, and I'm happy to be participating in something that they're organizing. Um, so we're going to be talking about politics tonight. And some of you might be wondering, is this ten of guy, is he left-leaning? Is he right-leaning? Um, well, the truth is that uh, very recently I broke my glasses. And so by the end of this evening, I will appear to be leaning one direction or another, or they might just fall off. So <laughs> I just want you to be, be prepared for that. Um, uh, as an academic, I, c I have sort of a sworn obligation um, to do a couple things. Uh, one is to give a PowerPoint lecture. Um, and so I have one prepared that um, I will start on in a second. The other is to do um, pop quizzes. So um, I'd like to begin with a pop quiz already referenced by Cherry, which is, um, what is special about June 30th? Why is that a significant date in Canada this year? You know? That's Yes. And why, why is it on that date? Uh-huh. <laughs> Before Canada Day. Um, I heard from John, I believe. Um, it is officially the pre-writ period, um, uh, which is a new period in the campaign season that was introduced um, recently uh, by the government, by legislation last year, in part to deal with issues around um, online advertising. Um, political advertising. Um, and so that lasts until the writ is dropped uh, at the end of, um, probably right at the end of August, which will be the official, beginning of the official campaign before the election. There's your pop quiz. Um, so yeah, this is a terrific time to be talking about this theme today, which is disinformation and the election. Okay, so what I am going to do in um, a reasonable amount of time is uh, just define what disinformation is or what we can think about uh, the types of disinformation that we might be concerned about.
the deep fake issue, um, the uh, use of bots and fake accounts, um, primarily for, for um, false information or for misrepresenting what different individuals and groups um, are interested in, illegal online ads, and harassment and hate. Um, and I should say that's something that journalists experience, political candidates experience, and some citizens experience, um, but certainly there's, um, it's not experienced evenly. So we know um, women, um, indigenous journalists and candidates, um, people of color are particularly um, vulnerable, well, particularly likely to be targeted for harassment and hate speech. And then the, d the fuzzier cases are um, distorted or torqued claims, um, uh, real hyperpartisan or polarizing content, um, different uses of memes. We have a meme expert right over there, Grace. Uh, sorry, she's a former student of mine, but she does have great, great thoughts on, on memes. Um, online ads, targeted, possibly mm, uh, torquing the truth a bit, but not violating laws. Um, and then issues around leaks of private documents, and that's a fuzzy case um, in part for journalists, in part because, yes, it might be part of an information operation by an adversarial actor, but it also might have true information with great news value. And so how to treat it is, is a tough question in some cases. All right, so there's a range of disinformation types that we can think about for this conversation. And many of these, it will be hard to tell whether they are misinformation or disinformation without knowing the intentions of the actors behind it. So here's a few particular issues that I think are important for the um, 2019 election, and I'm sure others will, um, will add to this list. One is foreign state interference, um, and the Communication Security Establishment of Canada, our spy agency, has said, um, yes, it's very likely that foreign states are going to be interfering um, in some way in the election, and that voters will encounter um, some form of interference. Russia is always top of this list for, for various geopolitical reasons and past behavior, um, though the CSE doesn't think it likely that Canada will see something on the scale of the Russian activity in the 2016 uh, U.S. election. But there are other states too. Um, there's uh, documentation of misinformation campaigns, disinformation campaigns, I should say, by um, Iran, Venezuela, um, and other um, states. And then a probably a, a, a particularly important one in the context of the Lower Mainland is uh, interference from China. Um, and this is something that both national security experts are concerned about, but also local journalists um, who are attentive to Chinese language media or work for a Chinese language media themselves. Um, and they point to a range of forms of state influence, um, including in elections. Uh, and this can be through um, business associations and local associations, but a really, I think, interesting and important one is um, the WeChat social media platform and the ability of China to censor topics on it, um, uh, which also affects journalism organizations and citizens in Canada. So um, many or several journalists I talk to who, who run um, news sites using WeChat channels say anything about um, Meng Wanzhou that they were publishing was getting just removed for a while, whether it was positive or negative. And there's some other topics too where stuff gets just removed. Um, and then there are concerns about uh, monitoring of people's messaging on WeChat. Um, so opportunities, certainly, levers for um, state interference in the election. Switching to more domestic actors, I think um, we're probably all aware that there's an increasing number of what can be called hyperpartisan organizations and groups online. Um, I've got some of them listed here. Some of them are quasi-journalism uh, groups like the Rebel, quasi-think tanks, um, and then popular online groups like the Yellow Best Canada. Um, and sometimes there's false claims made by these organizations, but almost always there is a real slant to the stories or the coverage that they give to issues. Um, and as one of the journalists I interviewed put it, the truth of the matter isn't really um, relevant in often. What is core to these um, 
to these publications and online groups is the emotion of it, the anger of it. And so this has contributed to something that um, we've certainly seen in other countries, including the US, which is um, increasing political polarization and, and the kind of knock-on effects that can have on um, democratic trust and um, citizen engagement. Okay, an even more severe version of, of this, of say hyperpartisanship or, or polarizing messaging um, is uh, something that, um, as I was, uh, Terry mentioned, I, I and other authors have referred to as harmful speech online. This includes things like hate speech, threat and intimidation, and so on. Um, this is a, uh, an offensive um, uh, sponsored post um, from the, the Russia International uh, Internet Research Agency um, that ran in the US in 2016, likening um, people coming across um, the border to, um, to uh, parasites that needed to be dealt with. Um, so generating um, uh, hate and resentment uh, during an election is a, is a well-known disinformation tactic. One issue that comes up increasingly I see online is this question about whether our election has already been rigged. And I've seen this kind of um, language on a number of sites, including um, this Facebook post, um, and it is usually directed at the Liberal Party and accusing them of through new election laws, through support for the journalism sector, which some liken to buying off journalists, um, and then in this post and others, through this suggestion that um, allowing illegal migrants to come here and vote for the Liberals, that all these are leading to a situation in which the Liberals have, uh, have already rigged the outcome which has just really serious ramifications for um, what happens depending on the outcome of an election, whether people accept a government as legitimate, and, and what politics looks like afterwards as well. So those are some of the problems, and we'll, we'll get to more. Um, very quickly on what a few institutions are doing to respond. Well, the Canadian government, I've already mentioned it, but new electoral laws, Bill C-76, um, the Elections Modernization Act has addresses some issues around online spending and mandates or requires social media platforms if they're going to run political ads to create an ad repository so people can see them. Um, and uh, Facebook had announced a while ago they would do it. Twitter just today said that they too, once the campaign starts in the fall, will create a repository to tell um, uh, what ad to show what ads are run, how much were spent on them, and some details around who um, receives them. There's a whole range of national security responses that Canada has pursued, um, setting up new task forces, in, um, creating what's called the critical election incident um, public protocol, which is a way to allow um, uh, officials, most of the deputy ministers, to tell politicians and the public that there is a disinformation campaign affecting the election um, when uh, the government has been dissolved for the campaign, which is um, helpful for various reasons. There's been a lot of money the government's given um, too recently towards digital, digital literacy training. Um, and then a, a recent thing is uh, what's called the Declaration on Electoral Integrity Online, which I will use to start off the platform responses because that is a set of aspirational principles that the uh, Canadian government and some of the platforms have committed themselves to in advance of the campaign. Things like transparency around ads, um, uh, the attempt to um, uh, address bots and fake accounts, um, and a few other um, principles. Uh, the social media companies have, uh, well, Facebook calls it a war room, I don't know if they all do, which are teams that are really focused on what's happening online on their platform during the election to look for um, inauth inauthentic or problematic uh, behavior. Um, some of these companies have been offering for several years now security, cybersecurity training to candidates and parties. And then this ad repository by Facebook and, and Twitter, which if it's working well, and in other countries it hasn't necessarily worked well, will give researchers a chance to see what, how money is being spent and how people are being influenced. And last, um, journalism organizations, some of them have really decided to double down on this topic and cover it well. Um, Lindsay will be able to tell you about what the discourse is doing, but some of the other ones are CBC has a 
uh, team that they've created across TV, radio, and internet um, programs um, that's going to be doing uh, work on disinformation with respect to the election. Um, Jeff Yates and colleagues at Radio Canada have a great, uh, really strong team doing online debunking and um, that sort of stuff. Uh, Toronto Star and BuzzFeed News, great collaboration um, with Craig Silverman and Alex, Alex Boutelier in particular. Um, National Observer here in town has, has a, um, uh, a focus on it. And then New Canadian Media is tracking rumours in diaspora populations, which is quite important because that's a um, population that often is targeted for state interference by sending state governments. Okay, so that's a very quick run through what some of the organizations are doing. A few questions that are worth talking about tonight um, is we know that this is very problematic, some of the abuses of um, um, political discourse, violations of, of um, expectations around um, what can be allowed for speech during elections, but who's gonna set the rules and, and how will they be um, seen as legitimate by people at different um, positions on, on a ideological spectrum. Um, we need to know a lot more about what actually works when you're trying to counteract disinformation and harmful speech. And then something that, that Chair mentioned that we're gonna get into, which is what can citizens do? Thank you. Well, John, actually, t to you, um, so w I understand that you were commissioned by the Alberta Federation of Labor to look into the Alberta elections and what happened specifically on Twitter there. Um, can you t tell us a little bit about that, just to paint a picture around um, how, what have we learned from that and how does that um, impact the Canadian information landscape? Thanks, Jerry. <coughs> testing, testing. Um, yes, yeah, so yes, I was uh, commissioned by the uh, Alberta Federation of Labor, um, so clearly a partisan organization. Um, however, they um, rules of engagement were such that um, they were hands off in terms of the research, in terms of what um, I was doing on their behalf. I'm really interested, and guess what? For two and a half years, people have come to me and want to know my opinion, but they've got their checkbook. Um, now it's got to make a living. The great thing is the Alberta Federation of Labor, they showed up with a checkbook and they let me do my thing, so I was all in. So for five weeks, um, I took a look at um, two of the key hashtags, AB Leg and AB Poly, and at the end of it, mashed all the data together, and what was really disconcerting is, so for starters, all the journalists I talked to about this report that I issued, um, I was really adamant about saying, this is really about synthetic behavior. Um, the whole thing about bots, um, that's really becoming quite distracting. Um, it's really difficult overall to ascertain exactly what is a bot. Um, and I think it's almost becoming sort of a, an excuse, like saying fake news. Um, if uh, a certain politician doesn't like a story, they can just call it fake news. Well, if somebody doesn't like what somebody's doing on Twitter, they'll just call them a bot. Um, so I was really adamant about trying to make this conversation about synthetic behavior, about fake behavior. Um, what I found was really disconcerting. It's actually been a trend that I've been seeing for the last couple of years in some of the research, but um, sort of we use a standard in, in looking at uh, behavior. And plus, just to be fair, we've got a real data desert problem. Is the reason we talk a lot about Twitter and the reason people are really interested in bots is because that's where we can get the data from. Um, there is no data from any other social platform available to really do, I think, the kind of analysis that needs to get done around some of these problems. Um, so to be clear, uh, this was Twitter specific. Um, Twitter is not the only game in town in terms of talking politics online in Canada, but I think it's representative, and I think a little bit of what I saw was indicative of, of what is a bigger problem, and I think what's happening now and is gonna uh, accelerate as we get towards October, 2000, uh, October of this year. Um, so we use a standard, um, I borrow from the Digital Forensic Lab, the DFR Lab, which is uh, out of the uh, Atlantic Council that do some of the best research, I believe, globally in this space. Um, so we look at it that if a Twitter account is tweeting, on average, 72 times per day, seven days a week, that's deemed suspicious. Um, and so you chuckle, 72 times a day? 
I'm finding profiles that are tweeting over 400 times a day. I often say they should be the ones that have sponsored by Red Bull by their profile. <laughs> but, um, you know, about 30%, I mean, this is what it really came down to when I went mashed all the numbers together, about 30% of the behavior over those five weeks uh, we deem suspicious, we deem synthetic. Um, I don't know about you, but three out of 10 participants in a political conversation um, operating at that kind of volume, uh, I found it really disconcerting. Uh, I don't think it's going to ratchet down as we get closer to October. Um, and there's a lot of other behaviors that, quite frankly, that we've been looking at and, and, and researching and trying to understand with some of the other work I'm doing that, um, you know, for me, it doesn't paint a great picture for what's coming on ter uh, in terms of uh, the pending election and uh, this October. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that's just one of the ways I deem some of these profiles. I consider, I, I call them the, the triple P threats because they are persistent, they are pervasive, and they are partisan. In fact, highly hyper-partisan. Um, I think Chris did a great job of and not really acknowledging, I think, a real good overall sense of this landscape is what we're looking at it. And um, so, yeah, um, the amount of hyper-partisan activity. So these are profiles that you'll look, um, should you dare. Um, you're not going to find their favorite hockey team scores. You're not going to find food porn, but you're going to find some of the best political memes that you never want to see. Um, so that's definitely part of what uh, my research revealed. Um, and there's some deeper, darker corners of the internet that right now I choose not to go, but um, that's where a lot of uh, what I think that con what we should really be concerned about in terms of particularly state actors and state interference and state influence is it's going to be in those deep corners of think places like 8chan, 4chan, Gab AI. That's where our real adversaries are operating to test, to see what works. And, you know, I think and that's the important thing is that, look, at none of this is new, people. I mean, uh, this has been gone since... Uh, I got an example of 44 BC, Octavius ran a great campaign against Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, um, helped lock him down as uh, Augustus Caesar. So, but what's happening and what I'm concerned about is this is happening at scale. This is happening borrowing marketing techniques, so you're seeing micro-targeting, you're seeing uh, A-B testing, so testing the content, seeing what works. Um, these are things all happening at scale. They are happening. Um, you might not want to believe it, but it is. That's Thanks. my rant for now. Oh, okay, <laughs> last, last couple of slides. This is really un unrelated, um, but this is interesting. These are both promoted ads that I screenshot, one out of my own Twitter feed and one out of my LinkedIn feed. Um, and uh, I'm also quick to point out, and as Chris acknowledged too, is that Russia is not the only game in town. We're at risk from a number of different state actors. Um, in this particular case, obviously, a lot of us probably took interest for the arrest that happened in uh, Vancouver in December uh, last, uh, last year. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what Huawei is advertising here, um, but it certainly isn't product. Um, it might be promoted, it might be transparent, but uh, in my books, uh, these are both very, very uh, overt forms of influence campaigning, um, mm -hmm. and I'll just leave it at that. And this is what we are going to continue to see more of. Great. Thank, thank you, John, and thank you, Chris, for really <laughs> painting the picture for us. Yeah, so, so as Chris mentioned, you know, one of, one of the strategies in response is journalism-based strategies, and, and that's kind of the field where, Lindsay, you're working in. So I was wondering if you can talk about the experience at the discourse and, and what the discourse is experiencing and whether you feel like journalists have the resources to respond to misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, and harmful speech. Yeah, thanks. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, the Discourse is a Vancouver-based company that is focused on in-depth journalism, genuinely getting out and listening to people, understanding what issues really matter, and then trying to do in-depth work based on that. Um, we don't tend to participate in, in daily news. We're doing more, more long-form and, and community-driven work um, in three communities. And so for us, when when... I think that Chris kind of acknowledged some of the amazing work that is happening around tracking of misinformation, and there's been lots of pilots of that in other countries as well, um, and that's not going to go away. A lot of fact-checking of information, is this true, where is this information coming from, you know, 
how do we know that, that this isn't from a foreign actor? How do we know what is getting to the root of the source of information, which I think is incredibly important, but, or and, I should say, fact-checking alone isn't going to, in my opinion, change the game. I think fact-checking is the first step in a lot of ways. Um, but if you just feed people with more facts and what they're responding to is emotion, more facts aren't going to solve at polarization, aren't going to lead to less hate, aren't going to, I mean, I see a lot of people nodding, so, so I assume that, that you kind of catch my drift on this one. Um, and so for us at the discourse, when we're thinking about like, what I spend a lot of time thinking about is like, where are communities left at the end of this? Where are real people left at, after a really vicious election cycle, which we, th we know is coming? And so being the name of our organization as the discourse, like how do we shift polarizing discourse? How do we, what does that even look like? Because I think that um, given that we know that journalism is an industry that is really focused on facts and more facts aren't going to help necessarily change the game. What does journalism look like in this landscape? Um, and so what, what we're thinking a lot about is how do we engage in meaningful conversation with people who don't agree? And how do we listen to a range of people? And that's not necessarily listening to the extreme ends and not using evidence, but it's how do we understand where people are getting their information from and like why they think that and how they know that and how do we change our practice to be more transparent about how we know what we know to actually help people feel like they're part of it and that they, um, they have information that helps them understand what our sources are and where our information is coming from. So we try to engage in really sticky, tricky conversations um, always and it's exhausting and it's not always the most fun thing but we actually have seen people respond to that. Like you, you would expect that if you if we publish a story about First Nations housing and someone's response is, you know, you know, those people don't pay tax, like, like serious racist stuff, but that's based in misinformation that is like generations of misinformation. If we just leave that there, then, then we're not furthering the discourse. So we're really trying to figure out how to engage in tricky, sticky conversations to hopefully have an impact on like community and democracy. Thanks, Lizzie, and I'm looking forward to drawing that out in, in the breakout session later on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Lindsay, as you were getting towards, you know, misinformation, disinformation kind of goes beyond the elections. And I know right now in the media, there's a lot of focus around Canada's election, pr um, protecting our democratic integrity. Um, I was wondering if um, the three of you can speak towards, you know, are we naive in, um, as Canadians to the influence campaigns that exist sort of beyond, beyond elections, beyond kind of politics as we think of like with the um, liberals and the NDP and conservatives, um, you know, what, what, do, what should we be aware of? What happens outside of elections that we need to be thinking about? Yeah, this is an issue that's way bigger than elections. Um, you know, in 2017, I actually dive, took a dive in and took a look at the anti-vax movement. Uh, look where we are today. I kind of thought that the measles were done with. Um, I acquaint actually what's going on as a form of biological warfare. Uh, I think it's really important to look at that any social cultural issue right now that we've got in front of us, that's a really vulnerable place. That's where our adversaries can firmly exploit further polarize us. I mean, look, a lot of this is a zero-sum game. I mean, um, in all fairness is that I often used to joke that for every mega-loving bot there was on Twitter, there was a resist bot. Our adversaries don't pick teams. They exist to erode our trust in ourselves, trust in facts, trust in truth, trust in our democratic institutions. Um, just because there's no bullets, there's no bombs, and there's no bodies. What's happening in cyberspace with bits, it's our brains that are being hacked. We need to talk about issues around cognitive security. So I have really big concerns over pick an issue. Um, and it doesn't take a lot, just throw some chum into the water and get the feeding frenzy going. I think um, you know the whole idea about outrage, um, doubt, these are today's commodities. This is what's gonna get you to click on a link. 
Um, you know, these are, you know, we've got some structural, we've got some real social issues to look at, and we have to really understand that there's a lot of areas where the, um, these vulnerabilities, this is where we're going to be exploited, where we are being exploited, because it's playing on this. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd just add that, um, that elections are useful times for addressing what's happening outside of elections because we have more um, legal and policy tools to demand transparency from the social media platforms, transparency about spends by third parties, which means neither candidates nor political parties. So it's a good snapshot into um, things that are happening all the time. And um, we also know that um, both sort of the um, Russian troll farm all the way to regular advertising companies do trials outside of the period of, of main campaigns. So, so the IRA was doing stuff back in um, 2014 looking at responses to um, conspiracy theories to, to sort of figure out the best techniques for, for convincing people of, of things. Um, so yeah, we're, we're continually being experimented on um, to, f but Elections are both a chance to bring more tools to bear, but also they are really high stakes because they shape not just who wins, but also what we've decided as countries are the issues that determine a mandate going forward or that, that matter. And so uh, an issue that I'm really concerned about in an election is that we get so worked up about a few things or a few incidences or a few, um, in, you know, in retrospect, small um, uh, gaffes and stuff that we miss it's the really critical issues that um, that we need to um, we need to advance on. Yeah, and I would just add. I mean, obviously, polarization and hate are not unique to an election cycle. And I think that, um, and and again, you know, indigenous. We know, like the stats from stats can show that that. Um, black and Jewish populations experience hate more. Indigenous people experience hate more. Um, so I, I think that that is not unique to the election cycle, but again, the election is a flashpoint. Um, and also to Chris's point about like what exists outside of the election in terms of our democracy and our institutions and, and the knowledge and information that we have. I mean, I obviously, I'm not an expert in all things disinformation or misinformation by any means, but I have done a lot of work on um, the state of the, Canadian journalism industry. And we know that journalism and democracy are deeply connected, and we also know that over 275 outlets have closed in the last 10 years. So the, the thing that's shifting is as there's more technology and more avenues for people to get out more information on their own, there's also less journalists. So for me, thinking, that, thinking about that, the election becomes a real flashpoint to see the impact that that's having on democracy. Just a last two cents worth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, so I'm not bullish actually on um, laws around uh, election advertising online, um, mainly because our adversaries aren't buying ads in rubles these days. Um, it's actually what's happening it, it for me is uh, one of the issues is, is go back to 2016, the operation of by one organization, two different Facebooks, uh, sorry, Facebook groups. Um, there was no advertising involved in that, right? That was getting to polarize groups, not only offline, but it got it actually got them offline and in the streets. You know, those are uh, techniques that I'm really concerned about. Um, you know, so uh, I, that, that's I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I, I have one more question for these speakers before opening it up to the audience questions. But before I get there, I'd like to remind you all about the post-it wall. So if you have questions that you would like asked, I would encourage you to write it down on a post-it. Um, we're also, um, our volunteers are helping to group the questions together. So it'll be really neat to be able to see a visual of kind of where your questions are intersecting um, so that we can make sure to cover the diversity of them. Um, so my last question, um, oh, and also you can flag a volunteer if you need a post-it or if you would like your post-it collected, our volunteers are going to come up and down the aisle to do that. 
All right, so my last question is the million dollar question, is what can we do about it? Obviously, we've talked about this for a while. It's all starting to kind of sink in and feel a bit scary and a bit like, oh no, okay, well, that's, I guess that's how it is now. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm, I'm really interested because we've talked a bit about you know, journalism responses, um, we've thought a bit about regulation-based responses, and also you know, what's the role of tech? Can tech self-regulate? So there's sort of three, three prongs, um, and I'm wondering if, if the three of you can speak a little bit to, to each of these and, and give us a sense for you know, what's being done, what's not being done, and, and um, what are some of the ways forward? Who would like to start? Um, I'll, I'll take a, a piece of that. Um, I think that one of the key issue areas is um, transparency of internet companies and particularly social media companies. Um, John's already discussed how we don't know what's happening. And wh one of the challenges is that as problematic behavior online comes to light, uh, behavior particularly on the platforms, um, it's after the fact, and sometimes the companies are taking um, smart action to address that particular problem, but they've already then changed their policies, or in Facebook's case, they've started shifting more things from public um, pages to private groups that would make it an, in, an even a new threat environment to use that, that language. Um, and and both journalists and researchers and outside regulators are always so far behind on being able to access the information they need to see what's going on and do something about it. So if we could understand better what's happening, I think we could apply existing laws and regulations better on things like we have laws on defamation, um, um, hate speech, and other forms of disinformation. Um, on problematic behavior and campaigns. So I think um, a transparency combined with um, effective enforcement of what we got is, is a good start. And then I have a whole other set of things to say about um, what's specific to social media we might want going forward, but I'll turn to you two. Sure, I'll go next just because I have the mic. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are a lot of, I'm just gonna speak to journalism again because that's what I know, but I think that there are three big things that journalism outlets can do. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, just given the um, coverage of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, the report, is uh, be a little bit more, or a lot more, mindful of op-eds. Um, op-eds are being used as a tool to spread misinformation and get perceived as facts, I guess op-eds and advertorials. Um, so that, that to me is a recent thing that has been, been really, really clear. The second um, is around assigning stories and around listening in, in communities that reflect the country. So I think that if all the journalists in Canada are based in downtown urban cores and are predominantly white, then we are failing as an, organiz as an institution um, so I would say that journalism organizations can do a better job of hiring more people in different places and not just assigning people to report on, this is my personal pet peeve, but like the royal wedding. Like how many people are we going to fly to London to report on the royal wedding? Like what does changing the number of, the amount, changing what we do with the resources we have look like? I don't think that's going to get solved overnight. Um, and so the third more like concrete thing that could a ton of outlets could do tomorrow is not just think of publishing a story as the end of the process. Um, I think that we as journalists have an obligation, like I said, to engage in what happens when that story is published. So engage in comment sections, not just delete them, engage in conversations and be more transparent about our process, about our, our sources and about the decisions that we make to kind of bring people along. Well, one of my colleagues pointed out just the other day that the, there is no uh, one silver bullet solution to this problem. It's about a thousand bullet solution, um, and we aren't anywhere close. Um, 
so look, part of the long game is without question, we've got to elevate um, some issues fundamentally around literacy to start with. A lot of times we talk about media literacy, we talk about digital literacy. Maybe we should also talk about literacy. Why do, why do memes work so well? Memes aren't tough to read, are they? Right, so you know, maybe uh, uh, we, we, we do, we literally, we have to address issues around literacy. We have to recognize, you know, these devices almost all of us have in a pocket have more computing power than what landed uh, Neil Armstrong and the team on the moon. Um, yet, there's no real instructions that come with them. So I'd say right off the bat, if any of you like get news alerts onto your phone, turn them off. Um, my advice to all of us as consumers of information and news, share less, verify more. Um, you know, sorry, you don't get your news from Facebook. How many people actually say they get their news from Facebook, yet they don't know the difference between whether they've read something from Breitbart or the Washington Post? So how about everybody take a vow to do a little bit more verification of what it is you read? And as Lindsay pointed out, let's know the difference between what opinion is and what news is. Um, and I think that would be a real big start, but this is a real long game. It's gonna take a long time to really elevate the kind of literacy we need to inoculate ourselves you know, as a society from these problems. So that's my two cents worth on that. Great. Um, I personally have a couple more questions that I want to go through, but I don't want to force you all to listen to me speak forever. Um, so why don't we turn it over to the audience questions. Um, Rasmus, you have a few for us. So this has been addressed to some degree, but maybe we can talk about uh, further into the future. How do we measure the impact of misinformation or disinformation on electoral election results? Who wants to take that one? No? So there's sort of three ways I look at, you know, when I approach this. I, I think about attribution, I think about intent, and I think about impact. Uh, when I approach my work, I can't do attribution. Um, because there's some three um, letter acronym organizations that don't themselves do uh, attribution very well. When Twitter dumped um, the uh, data that, that they claim these are 3,000 plus profiles related to the Internet Research Agency in Iran, um, they came back a couple months later and did the, oop, we, we bad, we wrong. We got about 300 of them wrong. Um, so even, you know, one of the platforms themselves don't do attribution that well. So attribution, who's behind it, the smoking gun, really difficult. Um, I'm interested in intent, intentional behavior. Those are some signals, those are some things that we can look at and we can research. In terms of impact, we are not going to know the impact of any of this for a long time. And largely because we don't have access to the data. We need a lot of longitudinal data, we need a lot of it, and we need to be asking the right questions of it. So my answer is, is we are not actually going to be able to know the impact of any of this for a real long time. Um, one interesting project that's happening for the Canadian election, um, it's called the Dif Digital Democracy Project, and it's funded by a few um, foundations and some funding from the Canadian government, and it's going to McGill University um, Public Policy Forum and University of Ottawa. So what they are doing is giving some um, a significant amount of funding for researchers to be able to access quite a lot of data of different types um, and really do um, some world-class research on how digital communication will affect political opinion and behavior in this election. And so one really interesting part of that is um, they've got uh, surveys that um, uh, give people access to trace data. So you can see all the websites that they access during people agree to um, have their site visits monitored. Um, and there's some rand um, anonymization to keep you from knowing who they are. So um, we, we will have a chance to be able to see um, exposure to different types of um, sites and how it affects um, voting and how maybe um, that uh, changes people's views. Um, and then also there's these studies of, ad, of the ads, which, I which are important, and, and the Globe and Mail and ProPublica are doing um, a collaboration um, looking at the ads served to people. So we will hopefully be able to get a sense of, again, the targeting and the persuasive or at worst 
manipulative messaging that are sent. So I think um, some things uh, that we'll, we will be seeing sooner, maybe not before the election, but you know how academics work, it can take a little longer. The, the actu I should say, a component of this is to give information to news organizations uh, during the campaign. So there will be some in, in the thick of it um, uh, research done and shared with news organizations. So I think that's a good step. And but it does re it did require people saying this is important, and we're going to put together a pool of money and be able to attract and um, and pay research groups in Canada and and outside um, to look at this. Um, Abdi, do you have another question for us? Uh, so the second question is, how can the tech industry help with disinformation? Or can the tech industry help with disinformation? Are any of the tech platforms immune? No, a lot of the solutions are actually counter-indicative to their business models. <laughs> uh, you know, look, I'm a longtime friend, uh, privacy manager engineer at Google, no longer there, in confidence, I'll not name him. Um, they worked on some really uh, exciting uh, projects uh, that uh, won't see the light of day. Uh, the other thing you have to look at too in terms of the technology companies and the platforms is that being an engineering driven organization, they're making engineering decisions based on what? Revenue. So a lot of the solutions that we need to these problems aren't exactly tied to revenue. Um, so. You know, I, I think some of what we see is uh, effective public relations that uh, uh, is a good way to say they are doing something about it. But, you know, I think until that we can address elements of how their business models uh, work, um, I don't think that there's a lot of vested interest in, in, in necessarily uh, making things better. Um, so, yeah, that's in terms of the uh, technology platforms. Please, uh, blockchain's not the answer. Uh, AI is not the answer. Um, understanding human intent, human behavior, and actually having people start to design tools with the understanding that there's not just rainbows and unicorns, but there's trolls and bad people too. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're in this kind of hurtful state is that we have had far too long not having enough adults in the room when it came to asking really hard questions about what is being built and why. Does it need to be built? Does it need to exist? And what are the unintended consequences of building it? I might uh, take the voice of the rainbows and unicorns uh, for a moment. I, I do think it was that it's we're kind of in a best of the times, worst of the times situation. I don't disagree with anything John said, but on the other hand, I think there's some um, just really um, terrific online resources for finding out and understanding political platforms for becoming part of campaigns. Um, there's some really interesting civic tech ventures to get people engaged in um, uh, yeah, local community building issues. So um, I think there's a lot of great stuff the tech community can do um, in terms of building um, ways for us to work together. And I think regardless of whether we improve the regulation of, of social media and get s more movement there or not, we're still gonna really be using the internet to connect with each other in on political issues and other ones. And so I think, yeah, there's a tremendous area for, for, for um, civic tech. And Chris, can you name some of these civic tech ventures just for folks who may wanna look these up or get engaged with them? Um, well, let's see. Oh, that's, that's, that's a terrible thing for you to have just done. Okay, so, um, <laughs> uh, okay, a few that come to mind. I like, I like, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, s well, one that's been around a little while, um, Voting Compass, I find really interesting that builds um, um, a way for people to, to go through a number of issues. CBC um, works with them, but they work with um, news organizations in, in a number of countries around the world to be able to get a sense of where people's platforms are, uh, pol po uh, political platforms of parties leading up to elections. Um, there's a number of um, organizations and groups that are trying to deal with um, bullying and harassment online. Um, uh, one, I think it's called Heart Mob, does interesting things. They're ones that are allow communities to come together, 
for people to reach out to bystanders um, to come and intervene in situations of harassment or provide advice. There's some, yeah, some really good new tools, uh, I forget the name of the organization, for um, helping people um, know what to do and get legal resources if dealing with revenge porn. So there's, there's a lot of, yeah, there's, a, there's quite a few going on. And I'll put, uh, yeah, I'll email you all with more, <laughs> more examples. Sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, I'm just personally curious, so thank you for that. Uh, Rasmus, I think you have another question for us from the audience. Do you believe whistleblowers like Assange contribute um, to aiding or, or undermining democracy? Interesting. Anyone? <laughs> I mean, whistleblowers in general, I, I think that a lot of this is in black and white. I think that, that I mean, maybe that's a cop-out answer, but <laughs> um, I, I think that I mean, before I was at Discourse, I worked for a show called Marketplace, which is all about, there's a lot of whistleblowers involved in that, um, in that reporting as well. And I think really it is about determining the public interest in, in what that becomes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, does it, so the question is, does it hurt or help democracy? I like to think that more information is like, even having the conversation I think helps democracy. The act itself, I, I don't know for sure. <laughs> um, again, maybe that's something to study a bit longer. But I do think making space for people to reveal information that they can't otherwise reveal is important. Um, and I think that the ability to do that matters, um, but who gets that privilege is a little more complicated. Yeah, and I think that there, whistleblowing is um, essential for institutional accountability because um, institutions often want to hide what they've done that is wrong, and sometimes the processes don't exist internally or in accountability organizations to get the truth out. So yeah, this has to be an option. But there's certainly there's good and bad whistleblowing, and I think a few um, principles uh, like do minimal harm. So one thing WikiLeaks often wasn't doing was removing personal information that didn't have real public um, policy or public uh, issue um, relevance and, and put it out there which could unnecessarily harm people. Um, the way they very strategically parceled out information to maximize its impact on the news cycle at the end of the 2016 US um, election is a great example of malinformation because it was not done simply to reveal the truth, but to influence um, what was talked about and how that election turned out. So um, I think a big part of it is whether you whether whistleblowers have, first of all, tried to go through appropriate legal channels first, um, uh, whether they uh, try to minimize harm, um, especially to those who, who aren't guilty of of doing anything wrong, um, and whether they try to share the information in a way that maximizes its public benefit rather than um, uh, you know, trying to manipulate um, political outcomes. Yeah, I think Daniel Ellsberg, Pentagon Papers, good. Panama Papers, good. Julian Assange, my book's not so good because I think actually it's really representative. What's, what's one of the things that's broken about journalism is the fact that uh, as I was all being leaked, the talk was all about the content of the email. It wasn't talking about how the email was gotten in the first place, and I really think that that was a real uh, travesty in 2016, that the actual issue wasn't a foreign government hacking the DNC's email, that they made the issue about the content of the email. If I'm not mistaken, in 1972, some guys broke into a certain office, and we had Watergate. Right, that was a physical break-in. So how come the, how come more wasn't made in 2016 about a foreign, you know, state-sponsored criminal act? I think it just is indicative of some of the a little bit of what the problem is with journalism. That, uh, like I said, it was more made of the content than the act. What are your thoughts on government temporarily blocking access to social media? 
example, Indonesia following the violent post-election protest in Sri Lanka in response to Easter bombings? This is an easier question for me. I don't think that the government should be able to block social media. I think, I mean, social media is an extension of freedom of speech in, and for me, that's a limitation of freedom of speech. Yeah, I think, uh, sorry, I, I just don't buy censorship and uh, that just opens up to my books way too slippery a slope as who's making that decision to shut down the conversation. And um, I just don't think that there's a place in democracy for having governments make those kind of decisions. Though if we don't have governments being a part of those decisions, they're just entirely made by foreign private companies. So I think, I so, Outright shutting all social media after an event seems deeply problematic. Um, situations like um, after the, the Christchurch shooting of um, governments putting pressure on, on uh, platforms to um, uh, take down videos is, is a different thing. And I think one of the things, so we always think of regulation as just making stuff disappear. Another way, another thing that regulation does is it makes the companies uh, can make the companies report what is happening. So if we look at what has happened in, in Germany um, with the Nets DG law there that requires platforms to act on um, content that likely violates existing German laws, we also, in addition to that process, we get the um, companies um, putting out, um, I think it's quarterly reports on exactly how many complaints according to this process, how many takedowns, and so, um, and, it, and it's done out in the public, so we can criticize it. We can say, you know, the government's going too far on this account, maybe, maybe not far enough there, and, and see, get a better sense of what's happening. So I think, I think we can think more creatively about, about regulation as not just about censorship. Well, I mean, in essence, you know, the algorithms themselves are censors. You know, look, a great example was um, out of Syria, an organization that's been collecting um, YouTube videos accumulating is a, as evidence for war crimes. Um, the algorithm, the machine, YouTube pulled down 400,000 of those videos that they'd archived. So algorithmic censorship, 400,000 videos that could have served as future evidence in war crimes in the Syrian uh, conflict have been removed, they're gone. Um, so you know, I think that's just another form of censorship that has nothing to actually do with the government. That's just the algorithms themselves. Yeah, when, uh, when do we get to ask these people questions? I can't, I can't wait to hear some of the thoughts from in the crowd. Uh, do you consider Canada's position on Venezuela's political situ situation to be, quote, foreign interference from their perspective? wants to take that one? <laughs> I just don't feel that informed to bring forward an opinion on that. Yeah, I, 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 um, I don't follow right, Ven Venezuelan policy issues. Um, I would say that governments are always trying to influence each other and, and influence each other both at the government to government level and government through public level. And that's gonna, that will, that's happened forever and it's gonna continue. So, um, but I do think we want to um, see that if Canadian government is trying to influence public opinions in other countries, um, real transparency, no um, use of fake accounts or hidden buys or um, uh, that kind of thing. And, and I don't know if we have seen that in the case of Venezuela. Now, other actions taken in Venezuela, which have nothing to do with sort of social media presence, uh, are another matter. But um, but I do think we need to recognize that that these attempts to influence other publics are are necessary and in some ways not a bad thing. But also um, try and uh, have a set of standards for that we that we insist that Canada and other and other like-minded governments um, stick to. And to your point earlier, Chris, as well about the idea of, you know, in the aftermath of the Christchurch shooting that the government pressured social media companies 
um, to take down videos. I think it's also the public pressured the government to pressure social media companies. So I think in, in any case like this, if, if, the, if the feeling is that there isn't enough transparency and you know, that the idea of social media as a platform for free speech in, in many different ways, I think that, that the public is powerful in that sense too, that, that social media can become a tool to pressure for more information or for um, the outcomes that individuals want for good or, or bad. Great, I think Abdi, you have one final question for us from the audience. Are people that are not on social media less vulnerable to miss or this mis or disinformation? Um, I don't, I would say no. Um, and this is again based on my opinion, not based on any specific research that comes to mind. Just in the sense that a lot of the misinformation myths that um, I deal with as a journalist predate social media. Um, so, so specifically thinking about the indigenous community and issues, like it's misinformation, stereotypes, these kinds of things. Like I just, I don't think that, oh, I'm not on social media so I'm totally immune. We also see things like flyers, uh, events, in-person engagements, conversations amongst friends, you know, I'll, just removing social media wouldn't suddenly solve this problem, um, is my take on it. Yeah, we, we still have newspaper, radio, television, so pick a media, there's still places that um, misinformation is gonna happen, so no, this has been happening for Yeah, and I'd say this is one of these issues that also will vary for different types of media consumers. Um, we do know that people who tend to go into more um, echo chambers online and on social media also tend to do it off social media as well. People who are more inclined to have conversations with people they disagree with politically are likely to do it both online and offline. So it's not like, yeah, it's not like the world changes once you go on social media. Um, on the other hand, there are specific things that social media does that is that is problematic. It um, amplifies certain emotional responses. Um, uh, it travels um, like me um, false information that evokes revulsion, anger, some of these other things, moves so quickly in a way that doesn't happen through newspapers, radio, and TV, perhaps aside from some you know, live talk shows, but even then there's, there's some moderation. So I think there's, yeah, there's, um, um, it varies. I think that's, that's a great segue to our breakout session because we're gonna ask you to talk about how you've encountered misinformation or um, harmful information within your personal lives, whether that's online um, or in some other format, maybe it's, it's face to face. Um, so before this event, we asked you to bring your gripe, um, if you didn't know that. Um, I'm sure you can come up with one. Um, we've asked you to come up with you know, how d have you encountered misinformation or harmful content within your personal lives, um, particularly maybe shared with between friends or, or, you know, between your kind of private social, online social network? I know for me, my mom has sent me really strange things about poisonous bananas, like <laughs> um, people putting disease um, into syringes into bananas um, that I've had to tell her is, is false. Um, so, so I'll let I'll let Lindsay set the stage for for the breakout session, and then we'll get our lovely speakers to float around and just chime in and, and hear about what you folks are chatting about, and think about strategies um, in responding. Okay, yeah, this is this is um, this little gripe moment um, is brought to you by me, mostly because I think that it's so easy to talk about the problems. Um, journalism is an industry built around <laughs> talking about problems and I, I want to acknowledge like all the different expertise in this room and the idea of like is there potentially some solutions that we can all actually apply to our lives so I had when I thought about this idea um, a while ago discourse was talking about having like a couple comedians come in and like host like bring your gripes and then we can like 
do an improv night or something to like work through them um, in more of a comedic way. So ho my hope is that people can have fun with this a little bit, even though I know a lot of the, the gripes are very serious. A lot of them are infused with a lot of racism and other systemic issues. Um, but what we found at, dis at the discourse is that when we do choose to engage with people um, that genuinely don't understand or genuinely are bringing forward something but they're not really sure why, it's just that emotional response, I feel like I shouldn't pay more taxes. I feel like you know, I'm being wronged by this thing. We've actually seen some pretty incredible results. So we've seen people who started out really combative and, and when you meet people, instead of yelling at someone who's yelling at you, when you meet people with like, help me understand, well, here's why we think, here's how we learned this. We've actually had people say like, I was totally wrong, I'm really sorry. And like, you don't expect that to happen. So my hope is that if we split up into groups kind of, um, maybe it would be helpful to do this, like if this is one group, feel free to um, workshop one idea, because we, we don't have that much time, so if someone wants to put forward one thing and then the group can, can work on it together or everyone can say kind of the thing they're thinking, maybe some of them are similar. And then if um, these kind of three rows here, and then the, if you guys split into two groups, this big chunk, um, and then this is probably three groups, maybe this, this front row and then like a middle chunk and then the back, there's people floating around and we can just bounce around. So to be really cl as clear as possible and for the folks on YouTube um, watching this, perhaps we can put the question up and then people can comment back and forth. Um, and so the idea here is to pick one or two gripes as a group or one or two pieces of misinformation that you constantly see that you don't know how to deal with um, and then work together to imagine a future in which we are able to have depolarizing conversations online or in person. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Break. Here we go. So everyone, we, we have about 10 minutes to chat about this, just so you all know, but I will also give you a wrap-up warning. Um, so go ahead, talk. <laughs> we'll also pass around post-its if anyone wants to take notes about your gripes, um, your strategies, and we'd love to capture them afterwards.
two minutes left, everyone. Two minutes.
All right, everyone. Hello. We're gonna bring you all, bring your attention back to back to the front. Um, so I know I know you've all been having really engaging conversations. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, I know within our group we had some really interesting um, conversations about you know what what does it look like to have um, debates that are you know we kind of feel like well we're just throwing a bunch of facts at each other and and that anti-vax person is super informed about their anti-vax things and we're super informed yeah. about our vaccine things and now we're just arguing all the time um, and feeling like we just want to shut down um, and you know how do we actually engage like what does that actually look like um, and how do we have conversations based on values rather than facts um, so that's something that I know we were talking about. I'm really interested to hear what you folks um, talked about and what some of the strategies are, um, perhaps to my question, or, or some of the ones that you you came across. Um, so does anyone want to share? Yeah, Gabe? Do you need the mic, or you want to project? And we are thinking maybe it's not just that one conversation, not tackling one at a time, but being part of that chorus where you know everybody's leading by example on these minority voices that are spreading this misinformation to get washed out by you know the majority that are saying, you know, you know check, check this out, and it's not necessarily being direct. It's all doing our part. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else have something similar that came out from their group? Or anything to share? Rasmus, you look like you kind of wanted to say something. <laughs> yeah. One thing that came up from our group of uh, personal responsibility uh, to to um, like we can consume media broadly, but if we share it, we need to make sure that we verify it before we share it, and that act of passing it on. Is, is, is a moment of where we need to be responsible for our actions. And, and just a general point that, that this situation does require a much higher level of, of personal responsibility in our, in our inter interaction compared to what was necessary in similar conversations going back uh, you know, in, in the past. My group's being a little bit shy, so I will um, just add here, in terms of that, in terms of that personal responsibility, um, we talked a little bit about the idea of the the responsibility, um, like where the burden lies with a lot of this, and and the idea that you know marginalized folks are disproportionately faced with the burden. Um, and so, I'm I'm adding to this a little bit here is the idea of like if you see something, say something, because um, if we if if it's just left to individuals who are constantly having to educate other people. Um, that is a, a big burden and it shouldn't just fall on, on one group. Um, and I think that um, we didn't necessarily get into this, um, but in terms of the practicality of it, um, and this applies to journalism, but I think it, it can apply to anyone who works for any outlet that publishes anything. Um, one thing that we, uh, we do before we publish a story is we think about what the comments are going to be. So we're like, okay, we're going to publish a story about First Nations housing in BC. Great. What kind of comments are we expecting, and what is our response going to be? Um, or we publish a lot of stories on, in the child welfare space, and we've actually heard from youth who say, "I don't want to talk to media because I've seen the comments. I don't want to share my perspective because I've seen what happens to people." So I think that it's it may seem like a small thing, but being prepared for what kind of comments you're going to get and having 
a response ready um, because people are watching and especially um, young people and I think that having those having those responses prepared ahead of time has really really been helpful um, and being really tra I, like I said when I, when we publish a big investigation we used to we usually also publish like here are all of our sources from this thing um, and then people can share that so it's not such a big deal to respond in the comments like hey you don't you don't agree with this like here's how we got our information is there anything we could have done differently is there anything we could have done better um, versus arguing on the opinion itself. Um, but I want to make space for other groups to share, but those are just some concrete ideas um, that we've tried. I just wanted to share the biggest advice we operate I with is don't feed the trolls. Well, Chris is... Er <laughs> now I feel like a speaker. Wow. It's official. Um, I, th I thought uh, the previous speaker had some interesting points um, uh, around, uh, uh, you know, don't be ashamed to speak up and, uh, you know, be prepared, know your facts. Um, there was another speaker in, in the other group who mentioned um, uh, how it's possible to change minds over time. I think that's totally true. I think it doesn't happen through a single conversation. Uh, I would also, um, on, on the other side, say a majority opinion is not necessarily a true opinion. It can be, uh, you know, that we uh, shame people who don't hold the same opinion. And in fact, what we see as people changing their minds is, uh, from uh, winning the, the, in the marketplace of ideas is simply that they feel shamed, uh, so they shut up. And, and this can uh, result in a, a strange thing we're, we're, we're seeing lately. I, I'm almost done. Uh, a, a, a strange thing uh, we've, we've seen in the last couple of years where media coverage goes in a certain way, uh, the culture seems to be training in a certain way, and election results go in a completely reverse direction. And this is because people don't feel comfortable speaking their minds, but they will vote in the secrecy of, of the ballot box to use their voice that way. So just an observation. Anyone from Chris's group want to share as well? Yeah, I, t I totally agree with that. I, I should add that the first um, step that we take in our in our moderation is to hide or report hate speech. It's not fair game, and I, John and I were talking this, about this a little bit before um, we started. Is you can think about we often spend a lot of time focusing on the extremes. So for us, it's like what is the how do we ignore the extremes and engage in that. Um, because definitely flagging hate speech is important and everyone should do it if you see it. Um, but, but I think it's about how do we shift from debating and trying to win an argument to listening and having respectful conversation, which is really challenging. 
just for the record, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and I don't think anyone's doing it perfectly. But. Great. Well, I'm sure we could go on forever, but it is time for me to wrap up the talk. And I'm sure you're all dying to eat the rest of our food and connect with each other. Um, so I just wanted to ask our speakers to give us some last, uh, just your final last five word takeaway um, for everyone. And I will pass it back to Lauren after that. The Mr. Back of the Class. <laughs> Time for your pops quiz. Hello? Um, <laughs> uh, last five words. Yeah, well, I, th I think that um, we've talked about how we think this is going to be an ugly election. And I do think this is an election that really matters, um, in part because of the issue of climate change. I think we're at a, like a global pivot point. And that and other issues. I just hope that all of us, whether in the media or just as citizens, can try and remind themselves what the big picture is about, what, what they hope from representatives, and, and yeah, and focus on that and, try, uh, and, and not get swept up in the horse race stuff, which is also um, an, uh, a real vulnerability to this kind of disinformation campaigns. Yeah, I think, uh, a, remember uh, that it's a lot easier to be amused than it is to be informed. It's, it's easy to hit that next little cat video than it is to verify what it is you're reading. So put the effort in to be informed. Turn off um, autoplay on YouTube and share less. Um, and I guess just my, my only real plug here as a, as a journalist and as a um, person that works at independent media um, is the idea of sharing, you know, look for content that you trust um, and then support that content. Um, In-depth journalism is not, is very expensive to produce um, and there's a lot, there's a huge shift that's happening in terms of audience funded models and the amazing thing about audience funded models versus, you know, advertising funded models is if if an organization is incentivized by what you want um, and you show that what you want is in-depth explanatory content, then more of that will be produced. So I think just a plug for journalism and democracy and if, if there are outlets that you believe in to support them in, in whatever way you can, whether by sharing their stories, by supporting them financially, or by recommending them to your friends. That's sort of my last little plug. Thank you so much. Um, will everyone join me in a huge round of applause for our speakers? Thank you. And I will pass it back to Lauren to close the event. And actually, before I formally close the event, I'm just going to pass the mic really briefly to Elena from um, Data Science for Social Good. She's going to talk about one of the many sort of next steps we can take Hi everyone, so my name is Elena, I'm a computer scientist. Um, I co-organize a meetup um, called Data Science for Social Good. Uh, good. Uh, it's essentially a series of talks and what we try to do with it is um, to point out both the good and the bad uh, that can uh, come with collection of data, use of AI, um, and so on and so forth. And so we were really happy when um, we learned about this event because uh, we felt it was really um, uh, related and, and uh, meaningful to what we're trying to achieve. So if you don't know about us already, look us up on um, uh, Meetup and uh, we will have more uh, events coming up. Um, and uh, if you have uh, ideas for perhaps giving talks or, or panel suggestions or any topics uh, for us, yeah, come talk to me contact us through the meetup um, uh, uh, communication system. Yes? Data science for social good. Thank you. Um, so I just want to thank John, Lindsay, Chris, and a huge thank you to Cherry for moderating tonight. Let's give him a round of applause. Um, 
Um, I want to thank all of you, our interactive audience. We couldn't have done this without you. And I want to say a special thank you to our volunteers tonight. Um, Peace Talks wouldn't be possible, and Peace Geeks probably wouldn't be possible without our dedicated core of volunteers. So thank you to each and every one of you for all of your help tonight. This Peace Talk was supported by the Digital Rights Community Grant Program, a partnership between Digital Justice Lab, Tech Reset Canada, and the Center for Digital Rights. And we do want to say thank you again to our community partners, including Elena and Data Science for Social Good, Amnesty International, SFU International, and SFU Public Square. I just want to remind you um, about donations. If you would like to donate to Peace Geeks, um, there is a little jar uh, by the front door on your way out, and we thank you very much for those contributions. Um, they make all the work we do, including hosting these talks possible. Um, also, please feel free to subscribe to the peacegeeks.org newsletter. Our wonderful intern, Kate, who's around here somewhere, um, is in charge of the newsletters this summer, and she sends out some really great um, updates about what we're up to. That's Kate over in the kitchen there. <laughs> If you don't already, please follow us on social media. And if you um, are engaging online with um, Peace Talks, the event tonight, please feel free to use our Peace Geeks um, and Peace Talks hashtags located throughout the room. Um, please eat the remaining food at the tables and just be mindful of your own garbage here in the seating area. There's garbage, compost, and recycling by the door. Um, photos will be posted soon, and there's a feedback survey on the table if you want to give any feedback. Um, we're constantly trying to uh, reflect and improve on the content and, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, format of <laughs> Feast Talks. Um, and with that, I think my notes are complete and my brain is fried, and thank you all for coming this evening. <laughs> <laughs>